it's been a, been quite a while and, and, and all these masks and everything else we have uh, well, that was a perfect song, Brother Lewis. That was a perfect song to segue into our message this morning. This morning we're looking at a new perspective on fear. You know, this is a fearful time that we're in between, between COVID and, 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 and the changes. We think we get it figured out and nope, it morphed, it's changed. And now don't do those things, now do these things. And, and, and just it's a chaotic time in our life. It's a chaotic time uh, in America. Uh, who is our president? Uh, I, I don't know. But you know what? I'm not responsible for that. And I listen to the news and I yell at the TV and my wife says, well, why do you watch it? And so I turn it off and then I find myself, I find myself over and over and over again, falling on my knees and just crying to the Lord. Nothing catches him by surprise. So friend, this message, it really comes out of my personal experience as much as my, my teaching in the brig. Uh, you know, uh, and for those maybe watching, uh, streaming online, I'm Chaplain Dave Schlichter. I'm the chaplain at the Naval Consolidated Brig, Chesapeake. It's a military prison. We have uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. Right now, the uh, Army uh, outnumbers the Navy in our, in our population. And I said, yeah, Army leads the way. Um, <laughs> maybe not in a good way. But... Uh, as uh, we all have to deal with fears. And your fears may be different from my fears, uh, and I would expect that to be true. But I'll tell you one thing, that's, the, that's one of the enemy's number one tools that he uses to discourage and to neutralize the people of God. You with me? I'm grateful to hear that you all uh, have instituted a prayer room. How can we as followers of Christ dare think anything of eternal impact is going to happen without prayer? That's where the battle is, ladies and gentlemen. We have to invest in it. We have to commit to it. We have to devote ourselves to seeking God's will and His plan and His way and His power. Scripture is, is, is throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It is through prayer that His power comes. So we need to be a people of prayer. We've already begun to recognize that our world is not the same as it used to be. Things are not as predictable as they used to be. And, you know, uh, again, that creates fear in many. My wife is not, a, not one who deals with change very well. And uh, so when uh, the, the, all these things are, are changing and happening, uh, it creates anxiety in her. So what she has done and I have done is we have gone... To what? We, what, what, what? What have we done? We have spent time together in? There you go, in prayer. And, and husbands and wives, if you're not praying with your wife, shame on you. How can you dare, how can you expect to have an intimate, loving relationship without meeting each other on the spiritual realm as well? But that's a whole nother lesson. But you know me, I've always got to throw some marriage point in there somehow, somewhere. But today we're going to be looking at uh, a new perspective on fear. I have to, let's try this one. Here we go, here we go. Testing one. Oh, here we go. Good. I, I told uh, Brother Lewis, I said, uh, this morning it's like I'm preaching on a jumbo jet. You know, we got, we got, we got the first class up front. We got the three, four chairs, four chairs. You know, I said, to Brother Lewis, you're going to bring a cart with tea and coffee and water up the middles. And uh, uh, Has anybody flown since COVID? Uh, oh, I, it's got to be miserable. Was not a pleasant experience. Yeah, I can't imagine that it would be. I, I hate wearing that. That I mean, although it makes me look better, you know, cover half my face. But uh, I, I hate wearing that thing. So uh, we'll just we'll just call this um, on this on this jet trip. We're here. We go together. All right. So what is fear? Fear is an unpleasant feeling triggered by the perception of danger, real or imagined. You see that coming from the Mayo Clinic. The perception of danger. See, it doesn't have to be real. You just have to believe it to be so. You with me? All right. 
And so the enemy doesn't have to make the, the, the dragon materialize as long as you believe that there's a dragon trying to get you. And I like to use the, the form of dragon uh, as, 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 as a fearful instrument, not necessarily a, as a negative thing, but the dragon uh, of fear. Where do these things come from? And what power does it have in our lives? Let's go to our, our, our scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. This is going to be uh, our intro scripture. As you know, as I speak, well, I, I, I've got nothing really of intelligence to say, all right? but I'll just be, keep bringing what the Word of God has to say. And if we would believe that, then that would be plenty enough, right? If we would believe it. All right, so... Uh, I see some folks turning to 2 Timothy, good. Uh, I was telling uh, uh, Brother Dave in the back, I, I have different, uh, um, I'll use different uh, um, seasons of, of people in my brig. Uh, and sometimes I have some mature Christians, and sometimes I have some babies. And so right now I'm in a season that I have a bunch of, of, of new believers. But it's so exciting because these new believers, and some of them were atheists before they came to the brig, and now uh, they've accepted Christ, and, and they're just devouring the Word. And it's so exciting to watch them grow and to blossom and, and to begin to practice the principles of Scripture and what God has to say. Because God doesn't lie to us, does He? Why do we think he does sometimes? You know, that's a lie that comes all the way from Genesis chapter 3, all the way to, from Eden. But let's, here we go, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Oh, also, you remember when, when, when Chaplain Dave preaches, if it's underlined, do you remember what we do? We read it out loud together. That way nobody gets to sleep during my messages. All right. So if it's underlined, yeah, you, this one doesn't have any, but you will have, see some, and you know, why do we? What's this underlined thing? All right. If it's underlined, we read it aloud together. We good? All right. I think we have the ground rule. So Second Timothy chapter one verse seven: For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Now I'm one who likes to think. Well, I am dyslexic, so often I think things backwards. All right, I, 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 learning disability and, and lear, learning how to read was, well, pretty traumatic. <laughs> uh, but God brought me through it. So let's look at this a little backwards. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. So when I have a spirit of fear, where does that come from? There you go, come on, you can tell me from the devil. It did not come from God, so it came from either the devil or my misperceptions, as we said, that fear is uh, an uncomfortable feeling, uh, perceived or real, okay? So this idea comes, the, uh, the devil certainly can generate it. He certainly does magnify it. What do I mean by that? He makes something that might be this big seem... What? This big, right? Right? That's exactly how he does it. Why? Because he wants the Christian to see himself, the devil, much larger than he really is. Therefore, if you are focusing upon the big opposition and the big dragon, what happens to your faith? God gets smaller in your perception. You with me? All right. Fear and faith cannot cohabitate. So, for God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity. All right. So, when we have a spirit of fear and timidity, where did it come from? So, it came from the enemy. But God did give us what? A spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Wait a minute. What about when I don't feel powerful? I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it talks about feeling there. Did you? Am I missing something? It doesn't say I feel powerful. But it says God did what? He gave us a spirit of power. He gave us a spirit of love and of self-discipline. What does this self-discipline part mean? It means that it requires us to discipline our mind, our thinking. It disciplines what we put into our mind and our thinking. 
So I'm not good at math, but I think somehow the equation would go the amount that I put into my thinking and into my being manifests by the output in proportion. Did I just make that real confusing? It's about like mathematics to me anyways. Right? right. Let, me, let me repeat that again. The amount of whatever I put into myself is a direct proportion what comes out of myself. You with me? So if I put in little God, what can I expect to come out? Little God. If I put in great fear, what can I expect to come out but great fear? Okay, good. We're, we're, we're on the same flight. I mean, on the same path here. All right. Let's, let's move on to the next text. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. This is a message to we believers in Jesus Christ. All right? Because a non-believer would not understand this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John 4, 18. I always have to give time for my, my guys to, to, to find it, you know, because there's St. John up in the Gospels, and then you got First and Second, Third John back in the back. I said, so just go all the way back to Revelation and turn left. You'll find it. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll find it there. All right, remember, if it's underlined, what do we do? Good team, good team. I'll fly anywhere with you all. Good, 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 good. All right. Such love has no fear. Oh, if we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Now, what is it saying to us, church? This, this love has no fear. You mean, that, because perfect love expels all fear. Let's, be, take, let's, let's take the number one fear that all oxygen breathers experience. What do you think that might be? Well, I'm glad you asked. Being good enough. Being accepted. Now, how do I derive this? Well, I can go back to Genesis chapter 3. Right? Adam and Eve are taking their stroll through the garden, and they end up having this conversation with a serpent. And the serpent says, first of all, this is a great sales technique, anybody in sales. This is quite, quite interesting. He begins with asking a very ludicrous question for, oh, for one purpose, and that's to enter you into dialogue. Did, you live in a garden. Did God say you can't eat of any of this stuff? That's like, you know, being in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory and not allowed to have a dip of chocolate or candy. Some of you have no clue what I just said. Right? But his purpose was to enter and pull, draw Eve into this dialogue. Oh, no, no, no. God says we can eat of any tree in the garden. And, 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 but this one, but the, the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil. And then he says, we can't even touch it. Now, what she's doing there is she's magnifying it even more, putting a high emphasis on it, of the importance of it. Get, get, now, whether Adam taught her that or God gave it to her, that doesn't, doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. And what does the serpent say? Oh, you, you surely will not die. Point number one. You can't trust God. You remember? You, did you hear that? Did you hear that? What the Satan? Who, does, who said that? The serpent? Who's the serpent? Satan? Satan says what? You can't trust God. You won't die. You surely won't die. Now, that is a truth and a myth, a lie at the same time. Now, if you're thinking about dying physically, did they die physically? No. But the more important, what did they do? They died spiritually. They told God that we can, we can do this. We really, we really don't need you. We can do this on our own. Thus, 
the very next step and why I say the, the, the greatest fear of well, most people, maybe not all, fear of being accepted. Why? Because immediately says they were naked and ashamed and they made coverings for themselves. I mean, I must cover up what I can't accept. I must cover up and hide from God. See, this, this, this scripture reaches all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. You must hide from God. Where God was saying, no, I knew you before you ate of the tree, and I know you now. <coughs> Excuse me. From his perspective, there is no change. So his love, his perfect love, expels all fear. Friends, if we would accept this, that God loves you perfectly. He loves you perfectly. He, does not, he sees you as if you have never sinned for believers in Christ Jesus, right? That have accepted Christ and, and, and have had their sins forgiven. He sees you as if you have never sinned. But what do we keep doing? We... Oh, we can't trust God. Uh, he, he, we, he's going to condemn me. Well, Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, so bring in your next argument. What, what, why? Why do we have such a hard time accepting this? Because Satan doesn't want you to accept his perfect, unrelenting love. And I'll talk more about that in a second. For it is fear, for fear of punishment. What's the greatest punishment from God? Eternal separation from him. That he will withdraw his presence from you because you're not, what? You're not good enough. Guess what? We're not. That's why we needed a Savior. That's why Jesus, right? We're not good enough. We cannot be good enough. We will never be good enough except Jesus. Jesus. He makes us good enough. And when we trust in his perfect love, there is no punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Why? Because we continue to fear. We're afraid of his punishment. We're afraid of his rejection. We're afraid of not being good enough. We're afraid of, you fill in your blank. Now, I, I, I'm not, no, 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 let me make a distinction here. I was thinking about this this morning um, while having breakfast. <clears throat> My daughter is 33. We have, we have uh, three uh, wonderful, incredible grand, grandkids from her and her husband. And uh, she is terrified of spiders. Of spiders. Um, just, I mean, just, she, even to see one on, on TV, she gets the EBGBs and, and, and cold sweat and, and all that. But, but she's a strong woman. You know, she does, she does construction work with me. She does, I mean, she's a strong, you know, wonderful, independent woman. But you see a spider? See ya. Guys, you know that's one of our number one roles as husbands, right? To kill bugs and remove uh, uh, squeaky things away from the house. That's, that, that's, I, 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 I think it's in the, uh, I forget what scripture that's in. That, uh, here, I keep waiting on Dave to change the slides, and this Dave, this Dave has got to change the slides. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, 35. That's something funny about this church, you know, you, if you forget somebody's name, just throw Dave out there and you probably got it right. <laughs> I think that's why you keep asking me back, isn't it? You can't remember another name. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 35. All right, let's do this together now. All right, this is your captain speaking. All right, let's one, two, three. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? That's what the world wants you to hear. See, see, Christians, you're having hard times. You're having illness. You're having difficulties. That means your God has abandoned you. Huh? Right? That's what society would say. 
That's what the Washington Post might say. All right? But what does Scripture say? He asks a form of question. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Looking at the intention, the, the, the in Greek there, he said, is there any condition that exists that separates you from Christ's love? This is, this is good. This is important, friends. If there is no condition that exists in anywhere that separates from Christ's love, then what does that mean for us? That we are loved and there's nothing you can do about it. Romans 8, continuing in that chapter, verses 38 through 39. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you hear this, friend? As you read this, as you read this, he's saying there is no condition that exists that can separate you from God's love. There is no time in all eternity that he says you're not good enough for believers in Christ. Now, I'm talking to believers in Christ. He says you are not loved. Man, that ought to bring peace. That ought to bring some real resolution to some of our fears. But God, I'm concerned about my job. I'm concerned about my health. I've got... <clears throat> Are you spending time in prayer? <clears throat> Are you spending time in your word? See, this is so critically important because what we meditate upon will change our response or will change our perspective. It will change how we see a problem for going from this big to, well, God's got it. God's got it. I was teaching recently <clears throat> in Bible study on Tuesday uh, at the Brig, and we were going through the book of Daniel. And uh, Daniel, you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It's a good v VBS story, remember? <clears throat> One of the things I love most about that, that story, as, as the music plays and all the world bows down, kind of easy to see who's standing up still. <laughs> Stand out. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, and they're brought to the king, and the king is upset. And he says, I'll give you one more time to submit. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I promise you it's not COVID. <coughs> <coughs> and they said in response, Oh, king. <clears throat> Our God can deliver us from your hands. But notice, they say, even if he does not, we will not bow down and worship you. We will not compromise our faith in him. That's one of my favorite passages of the scripture. Because, because he says, Our God can deliver us, but even if he does not, I'm not going to betray him. Do you have that kind of faith? Thank you, brother. <clears throat> mm. Do you have that kind of faith? Just because God's going to answer the circumstance in a different way. Right? He answered, didn't he? Remember, they threw him in the fire? Right? And the only ones who were hurt were the, the dudes who threw him in the fire. And the king says, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Hey, how, how many people do we throw in there? How many? Three? Well, why do I see four? Hmm. Now, I got it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not know how God was going to respond. But here's, that, that's irrelevant. 
What's important is how you respond in the circumstance as you look the devil in the eye. They had the faith, our God can deliver us, but even if he does not, I'm not going to betray him. Even if he does not. See, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen to a Christian? Your heart stops. Right? But you know what? <clears throat> now, I'm not a smart man, but um, statistics tell me that one out of one people die. <laughs> So the odds, uh, odds are pretty good, aren't they? That, um, that eventually we're going to cease from this earth unless Jesus comes back first. I'll give you, okay. But so, so if that's the worst thing that can happen, and to use Paul as he says, oh, if I die today, great, I get to be with the Lord. Uh, but if I don't, great, I get to tell somebody about Jesus. What an attitude. Was he afraid? No, why? Because he had a heavenly perspective. He trusted God in all circumstances. How did he get that? Because he's, he's super Christian? No. Because he believed what Jesus said. He believed who God was. All the way from the beginning to the end of his life. Friends, we have the full counsel of God right here. Why do we struggle with believing what Jesus says? What his word says? Why do we believe and we, we continue to give ear to the enemy that says, God doesn't care about you? Why do we believe the enemy when he says, oh, you've sinned too much? Keep in mind, I work in a prison, right? Right? Why do we believe? Why do we give him any credence in our relationships, in our own mind and heart? When Jesus says, you are forgiven, old things are passed away. You know what? <laughs> We're just going to make you completely new. You're a whole new creature, creation. A whole new creature. Right? And, and my perfect love... You need not fear. You need not fear, daughter, that you are perfect in my sight. Don't listen to society. You, you are perfect as you become more like me. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Oh, it's all underlined. See, I timed this right. Just about people start to lull into, into sleep. You with me? Here we go. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Now, <clears throat> something very important stands out in this text. First of all, who's showing their love? God is showing his love for us. And what was our status? Sinners. While we were still offensive, while we were still sinners, he showed his love for us. So what makes you think you can be good enough anyways? You know, and I don't find, and I've been studying scripture for many decades, that anywhere, I cannot find it in scripture where God expects us to be sinless, to be perfect. Because if that was the case then there would be no need for Jesus. All right? But because we needed a Savior, because while we were still sinners, God wanted to show His love to us. While we were still offensive in sin, God wanted to show His love for us. So He sent Christ to die for us. What does this do to the enemy when the enemy says, you're not good enough? You can smile at him and say, ha, you're right. <laughs> you're not always a liar. Sometimes you get it right. And an elderly gentleman in my church, I pastored a lifetime ago, and he always used to say, well, even a, a blind squirrel will find an acorn once in a while. <clears throat> it took me about a year living there before I figured out what he said. in such a strong Texas slang. But an acorn. <clears throat> 
Sometimes the enemy is right. But context is everything. Because even when the enemy was tempting Jesus, Jesus had, he used scripture. So the enemy, it can be persuasive. Right? But we need to use scripture as Jesus modeled for us. First words, he says, for it, it is written. What's he use? He's using scripture and he's putting it into context. Friends, how can you possibly use a weapon that you haven't trained on how to use? Meaning this, if you have not put the word into your mind, you're not going to have it to withdraw and to use when the time is necessary. You with me? <clears throat> We're going through a campaign now, and I'm, I'm encouraging my, 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 my prisoners to memorize scripture. And I, give them, I, I print the scriptures on a, on a business card so that they have it accessible and carry it in their pockets. And, and, and I test them on it. Now, if prisoners can do that, can't we? Are you memorizing the scripture? Titus, again, go to the back of the Revelation and turn left. It's a little bit easier. <clears throat> Paul writes to young Titus. Chapter 3. this passage of scripture because as Paul puts himself into it as well once we too right we also huh, were foolish and disobedient we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other but when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us, what's the word? righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life because of his what grace his grace his grace his grace Paul he confesses that we, we were once once misled sometimes in our thinking we can be misled we can be deceived we can be manipulated by our what our own many lusts and pleasures but, verse 4, you see that? But, ah, the but of God. That sounds like a good book title. <clears throat> Some of you might get that later as you're talking over lunch. <clears throat> when our God and Savior revealed his kindness and love. What was his kindness and love? He, he saved us. Why would a God expend so much energy, so much it, it, you know, it cost him everything to save us. His only begotten son to save us. Why would God save us if we were so detestable and so useless? And so you fill in the blank because we're not. But the enemy, we allow the enemy into our heads and into our hearts and we say God I can't do that I, I don't know how to do I can't uh, we argue with God when he, he says I know who you are notice verse 6 he what generously generously now I like that word he generously poured out the spirit upon us through Jesus Christ have you all ever attended uh, Southern Baptist baptism? I am in a Baptist church, right? Uh, all right. One of the things I like about, 
about that, right? There's no dry spots, right? After you're, you're, you're immersing and you come up, right? That's, that's, that's what generously here looks like. You are completely <laughs> covered <laughs> by His grace. There's no dry spot. Ooh, you missed a spot inside my ear. You know? No, no, He got you. He generously poured out His what? Notice the word, capital S. Spirit, His Holy Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ. Friend, if we have all of this at our disposal because of who we are, what do we need to be afraid of? Again, the very worst fear, as David spoke, would to be separated from God. Please, Lord, never take your presence from me. It's the very worst thing that could possibly happen. But yet we give value to so many other things. You know, I've been hungry. I, I, I've, been, I've been without money. You know, I was pastoring a church one time, and my wife <coughs> excuse me, called me called me into the bedroom, and she said, to, 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 tonight is, is, is our last supper. She said, we have no money, and we have no food. I had a wife and two kids, and she says, I don't know what to do. And I said, I don't either, but let's pray. So we went to the Lord in prayer. And nothing miraculous happened. So we ate dinner. <clears throat> I'm washing dishes. Gentlemen, another good plug. Good men wash dishes. Or at least we'll empty the dishwasher. Because we can never load it right. You know that, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, my wife was in the be back bedroom weeping. <clears throat> and as I'm washing dishes... The kids are getting ready for bed. There's a knock on the door. I look at the clock, and it's kind of kind of late, not near 30, 9 o'clock. I open the door, and uh, I can't even see who it is. Because they're holding this great big cardboard box. I think it said RCA on the side of it. And it's like, I don't need a TV, I need food. But no, nah, you know, you know how your mind goes real fast? <clears throat> and I hear the voice coming from behind. It says, Pastor Dave, we slaughtered a, a beef and our freezers are full. Can you use some? Now, interesting enough, two months earlier, somebody had gave, given us a chest freezer about the size of that first row. It was ugly as sin, but I cleaned it up and it worked fine. We need a lesson. It doesn't matter what you look like as long as you work. All right. <clears throat> but guess what? That freezer was empty. <laughs> empty as could be. And I said, yes, I can. All right? And so one teenager comes in. And then, oh, his brother, another teenager comes in. And then the dad comes in with three enormous boxes full of beef. And we just, I walked him to the, to the back shed, storage shed, and, and where the freezer was, and we filled it up. <clears throat> Didn't I know how God was going to answer our prayer? <laughs> Not at all. I, I sometimes say this. I'm just going to be dumb enough to trust God to be God. I, he's just, you know, he promised to take care of us if we would be obedient. In different times in our, in our life and ministry, it comes to those, uh, what we might call it a Red Sea moment. I'm standing with my toes in the water <clears throat> on the beach of the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army is coming down upon me. You can call it the tax man or <laughs> whatever bill is due, and you don't have anything for it. Satan's just watch and see. Trust God to be God, because he loves you. He loves you more than you can think or imagine. And that's so important that we recognize that. Because our mind is so limited, because it's been filled with the sinfulness of our world and the lies of the deceiver. He loves you with a mighty passion. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. So, letting our sinful nature... Control your mind, fear, leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life 
and peace who has control over your mind? Who has control over your mind? Letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Even in the midst of chaos, friends, because He's not bound by our circumstances. Spending time with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, these, I, I, all these scriptures, I, I, I teach out of the New Living Translation, um, largely because uh, I'm never sure of the education level and the reading capabilities of the people I work with. So you might be reading from the NIV or NASB or something, or CSB, and that might be a little, very little different, but the meaning is right there, solid. I cross-reference all of these. First John chapter 4, verse 18, which is our, which is our main text. Such love has no fear. Because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. Will you experience His perfect love today? And when those fears come, because they will, because the enemy is relentless, all right? When those, when those fears come, poke Him in the eye with the Scripture verse. All right? Or start singing Jesus loves me to him or, or whatever. You can't stand that stuff. Or he's going to challenge you. So what about you? Where do the thoughts and feelings of not being good enough come from? What do you do with them? What about those thoughts or feelings of being unwanted? Being weak? You're not smart. You're not pretty or handsome. You're fat, you're unattractive, or you're unloving, or unloved, or unlovable, or you're sin-stained. What about you? What are your thoughts and feelings? What do you do with these? Because they're real. And you just make these all up, from, and, 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 and I don't believe that it's just me. What do you do with these thoughts and feelings, friends? What about you? What do you fear? Why do you fear it? My daughter will tell me a story about a, a dime-sized spider and how she ran out of the house. And her 12-year-old standing on the back of the couch, squealing like a mouse. When all you have to do is hit it with a shoe. <laughs> Squish. Right? <laughs> What do you do with your fear? Why, is it, why are you afraid of that? Why, of whatever it is. Well, Pastor, you don't know. I've dealt with cancer before. and it took, I know. But see, I didn't write these verses that said you don't need to be afraid. Sometimes we hold on to this life way too much. How reasonable is your fear? Is it realistic? Or is it the shadow of a mouse that seems like a giant dragon? And what do these scriptures that we've covered today, what do they communicate to you, to your fear? I would recommend that you write these scriptures down and, and put them in your house and, or carry them in your wallet. And when those fears arise, you speak scripture to it. That's perfectly legitimate. Speak God's word to those fears. And how do you need to change your thinking? Will you trust the Lord? Will you trust His Word and what He's already said to you? Right. Jesus, we confess our dependence upon You. Lord, apart from You, we can do nothing. <laughs> and all because of You, we have been saved. Even saved from ourselves. Lord, we confess that we are a fearful people sometimes. Help us to saturate ourselves in you, in your word. Spending time in prayer, communicating with you and listening to you. Focusing upon you because we can't focus on you and our fear at the same time. So we must choose and choose wisely. Will we give more time and attention to the fear or to the one who says he loves us, the one, the omnipotent one? 
Help us to choose wisely. For you have not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. But you have given us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Let us walk accordingly as your people, reflecting you, Jesus, in all that we do and say, walking in your spirit and your power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your graciousness to listen. And I pray that these scriptures will burn into your heart. Amen.